Today, we're picking up the story of the Achaemenid Empire around the year 400 BC. By this time, the empire had lived out the majority of its history, though its king Artaxerxes II was surely unaware of this. In just 70 years, the largest empire to have thus far graced the globe would be conquered and its king dead. I covered the earlier history of the empire in three videos, and this is the fourth and last of the Achaemenid Empire series, which marks my first attempt at learning and laying out the history of this great empire. We pick up the story in 400 BC, just about five years into the reign of Artaxerxes II, after Egypt had successfully rebelled, and after Artaxerxes put down a rebellion started by the lead satrap of the western satrapies, his brother Cyrus. We're going to cover the remaining years of the empire until the murder of Darius III in 330 BC. Artaxerxes II would go on to be the longest reigning Achaemenid king, ruling until his death in late 359 or early 358 BC. As we'll see, Artaxerxes faced a number of other rebellions during his reign, conducted significant building projects, and established a favorable to Persia arrangement with mainland Greece. First off, in the first decade of the new century, Artaxerxes II turned his attention to Asia Minor, where Sparta was causing trouble. By 404 BC, thanks to financial aid from Persia, Sparta had come out on top of the Greek mainland powers at the end of the Peloponnesian War. Sparta had then helped Cyrus in his failed rebellion against Artaxerxes, now under their new king, Agesilaus II, Sparta began conducting raids in Asia Minor in 399 BC. Some of these expeditions were more than mere raids and skirmishes, reaching proper battles. Agesilaus himself headed over to take lead in 396 BC. In Asia Minor, leading the Persian counter-effort when local troops were insufficient were the two satraps or governors of the region. Pharnabazus was the satrap of Hellespontine Phrygia, centered at Dasculeon. Meanwhile, for the satrap at Sardis, whose domain included both Lydia and Ionia, the prior king Darius II had earlier placed Tissaphernes in that position. But Darius II had then replaced Tissaphernes with Cyrus in 408 BC, and after Cyrus was killed in his failed revolt, Artaxerxes II placed Tissaphernes back into the leadership role at Sardis. This favorable relationship with Tissaphernes came to an end after not too long when Tissaphernes failed in battle against the Spartan Agesilaus and failed to contain his raiding. Artaxerxes had Tissaphernes executed and replaced him with Tithraustes. This failure of Tissaphernes occurred when Agesilaus headed towards Sardis, raided the surrounding area, beat Tissaphernes and his forces when they arrived, and then raided some more further inland. In the end, what got Sparta out of the picture and forced Agesilaus to leave were the challenges Sparta faced to her power back home. Namely, Thebes, Corinth, and Athens, with the help of Persian gold, allied against Sparta in 395 BC and were a threat Agesilaus couldn't ignore. The Corinthian War between Sparta and the allied Greeks was underway. In leaving Achaemenid land, Agesilaus took the land route, crossing the Hellespont and marching west through Thrace. He'd left behind a Spartan fleet, and a Persian fleet, partially under the charge of Pharnabazus, attacked the Spartan fleet at Nidus. A little more work was subsequently needed, banishing Spartan governors and garrisons, and with that, Spartan power was largely removed from Ionia. Persian ships now made their way across the Aegean. There, they asserted their naval dominance and increased pressure on Sparta as they cruised and raided the Peloponnesian coasts, as well as providing lots of money to members of the Corinthian alliance. By 392 BC, Sparta began making efforts towards an understanding with Persia, and sure enough, a couple of years later, Persia turned their backs on their erstwhile allies. The satrap of Sardis by this time was Tiribazus, and in 392 Sparta sent over an ambassador to Tiribazus attempting to turn Persia against Athens, accusing Athens of attempting to rebuild their empire. 
An ensuing conference, which included the anti-Spartan alliance as well, failed to find a viable path forward, and shortly thereafter, the satrap Tiribazas traveled to the Persian capital of Susa to report on things. While away, Tiribazas was temporarily replaced as satrap by Struthis, who enacted an anti-Spartan approach. In the 380s BC, Tiribazas took back the position of satrap, and the Spartan ambassador and him entered into negotiations. In 386 BC, the king's peace was reached, and Greece would feel the shame of this treaty in the years to come. The terms had it that Asia Minor and Cyprus were Persian-owned, and Persia wouldn't get in Sparta's way in Greece itself. Sparta itself wouldn't have an easy time ahead, but that was their problem, or so Persia thought. For Persia, Greek conflict for the moment could be constrained away from Persia, and not involve the raiding or taking control of Persia's land and people. But arguably, this diplomatic victory opened the room for the evolution of Greek military tactics and technology away from the eyes and arms of Persia. And while the Greeks roiled in the adaptation-inducing horrors of war, and a certain King Philip II of Macedon started innovating in significant ways, Persia needn't pay that much attention. When it finally came time that Persia had to get seriously involved again, it was too late and Alexander ate their empire. Despite this possible partial interpretation of the ensuing events, the king's peace was a big win for Persia, and many psyches on the Greek mainland would fixate on how the lack of their cohesion brought them to this shameful agreement. The success in Persia's affairs with the Greeks was followed by their military failure in Egypt. Starting in 385, freed from concerns in Greece, Persia now failed in their attempts at attacking their way into Egypt. Sometime later, Artaxerxes himself led a campaign against the Caduceans of the mountains, though it's unknown what the cause of this was. This campaign was successful, despite serious hardship, due to the scarcity of food in the mountains. As for Egypt, in the 370s, Persia made a further attempt at ending the now over 25-year-long rebellion. 377 saw Pharnabazus assigned to command forces against Egypt, over the ensuing years, Pharnabazus gathered his forces, and then in 373, he and his forces, along with the Athenian Ephicrates and the mercenaries under his control, set their way to Egypt by sea. The Persian force successfully landed, and after delaying and unfortunately allowing for the Egyptians to gain reinforcements, they attempted to make their way south. On the way, they faced determined Egyptian defenders, and an unfavorable flooding Nile. Their efforts failed, and they withdrew in June of that year. Artaxerxes was facing other problems in 372 BC, and Egypt would remain independent through the rest of his reign. Over the coming years, picking up around 372 with Datames of Cappadocia, a number of satraps staged uprisings. Another revolting satrap, Ario Barzanes, received help from the Spartans and Athenians, who by now were increasingly hostile to Persia, thanks to Persian support of Thebes. The satrap rebellions had been put down by around 362 BC. This brings us very near to the end of Artaxerxes II's reign, but before we move to his overness, let's consider his building projects. While his tomb was modeled in the style of the earlier Persian kings, Unlike them, Artaxerxes II had his tomb constructed not at Naqsherustam, but in the slopes above Persepolis. He also continued the rebuilding of the fire-damaged Susa Apadana, that of Darius I, and he had his own palace constructed at Susa. In a trilingual inscription at Susa, Artaxerxes II gives us the first testimony by a Persian king of specific Persian gods other than Ahura Mazda. Though, of course, other gods of other places they'd taken over had been mentioned before, such as Marduk of Babylon or Horus of Egypt. Here, Artaxerxes declares through inscription, quote, By the will of Ahura Mazda, Anahita, and Mithra, I built this palace. Unquote. Anahita is the divinity of the waters, and Artaxerxes had temples and statues made for her, and her cult spread around this time. Mithra is associated with the sun. Artaxerxes also had a palace built at Babylon and in Apadana at Ekbatana. 
the longest reigning king of Achaemenid history, finally died in 359 or 358 BC, and he was followed by his son, Ochus. Ochus took the throne name Artaxerxes, and now Artaxerxes III enacted a policy to weaken the satraps. You'll recall that late in his father's reign, some satraps had revolted, and even earlier at the start of his father's reign, Artaxerxes II's brother Cyrus, then satrap at Sardis, had rebelled as well. Now, Artaxerxes III had the satraps disband their mercenary forces, lessening the chance of revolt. Though there was a revolt by Artabazus II, which by 353 had ended with Artabazus heading out of town to take up refuge in the court of Philip II of Macedon. Artaxerxes III also faced rebellions from Phoenicia, Anatolia, and Cyprus. He had them put down, including with the campaign against Sidon he himself led. Most impressively, however, after a long run of independence, Artaxerxes III managed to resubjugate Egypt under Achaemenid rule. His army was sufficiently successful in Egypt that Pharaoh Nectanebo II fled around 340 BC. Artaxerxes III would die a couple of years later in 338 BC, perhaps from poison. By this time, Mastodon under Philip II had taken over much of Greece, and had made warring efforts in Thrace in areas under Persian influence. Shortly after Artaxerxes' death, Philip II would even send a force into Asia Minor. But Philip II wasn't too long for the world either, and he soon followed Artaxerxes III in death, sliding out of existence in 336 BC. His son and successor, Alexander, would soon amplify Dad's vision. Before moving on from Artaxerxes III, for his building projects, he had built the palace in Persepolis, and alongside his father's tomb in the hills above Persepolis, he had his own tomb built. Some of his works were unfinished, including the unfinished gate at Persepolis. According to Diodorus, Artaxerxes III, as well as other members of his family, were poisoned by his vizier Bagoas, though cuneiform tablets suggest that Artaxerxes III died of natural causes. Perhaps it was Bagoas who placed the next king on the throne, the young son of Artaxerxes III, Arces or Artaxerxes IV. Diodorus describes how Bagoas had Artaxerxes IV killed just two years later after the young king had gotten the idea to try to knock off Bagoas. A cousin of Artaxerxes IV, Artashita, then came to be king in 336 BC. He would soon be dead, and his empire would be Alexander's. His throne name was Darius III. Alexander invaded Asia Minor in spring of 334 BC, crossing the Hellespont and first setting up shop at Troy. Shortly thereafter, in May 334, the first major battle was fought, the Battle of the Granicus. On the Achaemenid side, their Persian cavalry were set out some distance in front of their Greek mercenary infantry and when the cavalry was sent fleeing after fierce battle, the Greek mercenaries were surrounded. Alexander was particularly unsympathetic to them, as he hated the idea of Greeks fighting against what he insisted was their liberation. Most of the mercenaries were killed, and the survivors got sent to lives of hard labor in mines. Alexander continued deeper into the Persian Empire, towns surrendering to him along the way and when he reached Sardis, he took it without any battle. As he passed through, the inhabitants largely went one day to the next, living much the same lives. Not everyone went without a fight, however. The Persian fleet had made its way to Halicarnassus, and Orontobates and Memnon led the defense of Halicarnassus. After some battle, Memnon withdrew before dying soon after. Alexander then made his way northeast, capturing some important cities, including Gordian, where he's said to have solved the untangling of the Gordian knot by slicing through it. In the summer of 333 BC, Alexander started heading south, and in full, Alexander was on the move again, first east and then south. On the way, when he passed Issus, Alexander left behind an army hospital for his injured soldiers. But some time after passing Issus, he found out that Darius III was now behind him. 
Darius had snuck his army through a mountain pass, massacred those left at Issus, and soon reached the river Panaros, where Alexander joined him. The ensuing battle ended in Darius fleeing and Persian defeat. And along with military defeat, a major diplomatic defeat came in the fact that Darius had left his wife, mother, and children behind, who now found themselves in Alexander's hands. When Darius reached out to ask for them back, as well as offer a treaty with Alexander, Alexander rejected his request and offered soundly and called on Darius to approach him as a suppliant rather than as an equal and to address Alexander as the king of all Asia. Alexander now headed further south, and he sent a message to Tyre asking for permission to worship their god, Melkart. Not particularly favorable to allowing the invader freely within their walls, Tyre refused. Tyre then rejected an offer of alliance, and Alexander set siege in 332 BC. Gaza also refused to bend the knee to Alexander. Gaza and Tyre were soon defeated, and in the takeover of Tyre, Alexander had the help of the part of the formerly Persian navy who were from cities that now found themselves under his rule. With Gaza having fallen, no further obstacles arose on Alexander's path to Egypt. Upon reaching Egypt, Alexander was welcomed by the region's satrap, and Egypt was his. Alexander spent the winter in Egypt before heading out and reaching Tyre in spring 331 BC. They made it to Thapsacus in the summer. Alexander opted not to take the direct route to Babylon down along the Euphrates. Instead, he chose the less hot and easier to forage route as he headed northeast and then turned back south once he crossed the Tigris. Darius, meanwhile, having assembled an army in Babylon, had begun to head up north to greet Alexander at Galgamela. While the Persian forces waited at Galgamela, they cleared the plain and smoothed it out. Alexander arrived, battle ensued, and Darius fled. Alexander was prevented from pursuing Darius due to Macedonian struggles on their left wing which called his urgent attention. With this, Darius's last chance had come and gone, though he didn't know it yet. He now made his way to Akbatana and tried to raise the third army, left to rely solely on the forces of the eastern part of his empire who didn't show up this time. Alexander, meanwhile, began taking Persian capitals one after the other. He marched on Babylon, where he was welcomed, then he turned east to the heartland of the Achaemenid Empire and took Susa without a fight but he did find the fight farther east as he crossed through the Persian gate on his way to Persepolis. There, the satrap of Persis, Ario Barzanes, led his forces in ambush against Alexander and inflicted heavy casualties on the Macedonian forces. But Alexander eventually broke through and soon reached and took both Persepolis and Pasargade. After staying at Persepolis for the winter, Persepolis was set to flames. Alexander then headed towards Ecbatana in 330 BC, seeking out Darius. Darius left the last Persian capital and retreated towards Bactria with a couple of thousand troops. Along the way, many deserted. As Alexander got closer, Darius was stabbed by those close to him in the summer of 330 BC and was left by the side of the road, where a Macedonian soldier soon found him either dead or just about to die. Alexander would continue his solidification of rule over Persia and even make further conquests now, though he would in fact never fully subjugate the far northeast of the Persian Empire. But from the bigger picture, the Persian Empire is now the Macedonian Empire, and her story, along with Alexander's, will have to wait for another day. Over the coming centuries, a number of empires would rule much of the land previously held by the Persians, first of course as the Macedonian Empire, but Alexander would soon die and the Seleucid Empire would follow, before the Parthian Empire and Sasanian Empire and beyond. All of that awaits as we explore the history of reality from the beginning to now. I'll see you in the next one.